Most of us don't have the luxury of always starting from the beginning. Most of us start with a legacy of code. So how do we make such code a nice place to work? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Uh, welcome to my channel. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe and if you like the video, hit like. Um, today, I'd like to try something a little bit different. Uh, I, I want to do an exercise in working with some existing code. I'd like to demonstrate some of the techniques of improving existing code uh, and the application of a simple four-step process that I tend to use myself when I'm working in those, those kinds of environments. Um, I'm going to cover all of this in a few separate episodes. So I'm going to create this little mini series of linked videos to get, allow me to explore this in a little bit more depth than, than I would normally cover in a video. So, so where do we start? Where do we begin with such things? Well, I started by going and doing a search on the internet for bad code, and, and I found some. So we're going to start with some fairly poorly organized code. The code that I picked is pretty nasty. Um, it's focused on trying to translate a specific format of XML uh, into some JSON and it's very tightly coupled to that format of XML. I'm not going to try and change any of that, but I'm just going to try and keep the code working and make it better uh, as part of my efforts. So I recorded me working through this bad code and refactoring it. I'm going to release this as a series of videos. I'm going to do three vid edited videos that highlight different aspects of the work and I'm going to release the whole thing uh, from end to end for those people that would like to see the whole process. The first in this mini-series focuses on two things. Approval testing and removing clutter. The next will cover reducing complexity and composing methods. And the last in the series will look at refactoring to testability. And then we've got the whole video, which we'll, we'll release some other way. One of the techniques that I fairly recently adopted is one called approval testing. And I must admit that the first time that I heard about approval testing, I was a bit dismissive of it. And that was my bad. I misunderstood the context in which approval testing makes sense, at least because approval testing is a great tool if you use it in the right context. And the, that context is exactly this. When you've got a body of existing code and you'd like to safely change that code without changing its behavior, which is what refactoring is, then um, how do you do that? What sorts of tests can you create that allow you to do that? And approval testing allows you to do that, create those sorts of tests quickly and efficiently. So I've started off by building the outlines of such an approval test. So here's my test. It, it's, I've got one test case at the moment. Should translate empty XML to JSON, which is basically just saying what the whole piece of code does. So I'm going to create an instance of the class, the XML to JSON class. I'm going to supply it with some appropriate um, resources. So this is a search key that's mentioned in one of the comments as an example. There's a main method in the in the blo block of the code. So I just ripped this that's used as a test. So I just ripped this out and copied that. I didn't have access to the original XML file that the this code was used uh, was tested with. So I've created my own from what I could interpret from the um, uh, from the, the comments in the code. Um, this is a bit ironic because usually I, I, I recommend that people do try to avoid comments in code. Uh, in this case, I've actually relied on them. In this case, though, I've, I've kind of got these input parameters and I've got these to a stage where they're giving me a certain level of coverage in the test. So if I run this approval test now, so the, sorry, I should explain the way that approval tests work. So what happens when you in an approval test is it just captures the output from the code that you call. Whatever you, whatever it is that you call, in this case I'm calling get JSON, which is the key method. This is the method, this is the public method that we'll be testing on this class. 
with my test parameters. And when I call the getJson method, I'm going to get a result. What you do with the, the first time you run an approval test, that test will fail. Uh, but what you can then do is that you can save, you can save a, an image of that result to disk. And then subsequently, every time that you run the approval test, it's going to run the code again, generate the results again, and just do a straight comparison between the, the version that you saved and the version that you've just generated in the context of this test. As long as the output remains the same, the test will pass. You have approval. If you make a change and it disrupts that, it stops the, the, the code doing what it was doing before, the test will fail and inform you of that fact. So it's a very, very useful tool when you're doing refactoring where the whole point is to avoid changing the behavior of the code, at least at this stage. So if I run my approval test now, I've already saved the image and my test passes, so that's all good. The other thing that I can usefully do is that I can run the approval test with coverage. And I can see that at the moment, the level of line coverage and uh, method coverage that I have, I've got 66% of methods, but I'm only covering 85% of the lines of code. If that's all I could get, I would feel reasonably confident in still proceeding using very cautious refactoring techniques to make changes to this code base with that level of protection. To be honest, there are some refactorings that I will do in a code base without any tests because I'm confident in their ability, my ability to make those sorts of changes without breaking things. But having the test is a great, great defense and gives you a much higher level of confidence that you can proceed and carry out more risky changes to the code, as we'll see as we go through this exercise. So we can dig in and we can see what that means in terms of the coverage in the code. So here's my code. And where there's a little green bar on the side here, it means that this has been co this the test covers that case. And there's a line here. So if the XPath string doesn't begin with a slash, it, it, it finds the root node. That's not a very risky thing in my mind to test. Uh, there's some commented out code here. Um, and th that block, because it's all commented out. Uh, maybe not, there's a bit more. Yeah, there's not much going on there. So here's my test, and that's giving that's giving me a certain amount of confidence to be able to make some progress. So I think the first step in refactoring these things is let's just get rid of some of the clutter. Um, I'm going to leave some of the comments that seem like they might be useful. I'm trying to do this as though it's a I'm trying to behave as though I'm really doing this in a real production situation, and so I'm going to be somewhat cautious in terms of moving forwards. But you've also got to have a degree of courage and confidence. You've got to be able to take some chances uh, along the way with some of this stuff. So first, looking at these, uh, there's an awful lot of stuff that I'm not very interested in here. Um, it's really not telling me very much. I'm going to leave this for now and come back to this. This thing, so the parameter of the URL path, uh, to so if we were to rename this variable to um, URL URL to talk, which is what the document's called, that kind of eliminates the need for this, all of the rest of this stuff is just waste it's not telling us anything so that can go um, this iterator is list over a list of elements well the code tells us that so that can go um, current element has children itself state should be closed so has children equals true. So we could say that if we change that, if we named that evaluation, so if we created a method called um, has children, So 
so has children that means we can get rid of this Um, let's just look at that again for a moment. The current element has children itself, state should be closed. So what we're really interested in is, is the state closed? Let's come back to that for now, because we're just removing clutter at the moment. So has children removes the need for that documentation. Bull, that's just what, dead code. That's just dead code. Document element always has a file attribute. Um, that's just telling stuff that's not very interesting. That's each one has to have a data. Yeah, it's not really helping. So let's get rid of it. Uh, more dead code. In the real world, if I was doing this kind of thing, I would be certain that I would have uh, the original version in version control, the original version of the code, and I would be periodically, uh, pretty much every time I run a test, I would commit the result so that I'm at a stable point. For efficiency of doing this, I'm, I'm not going to commit this every time. I'm not keeping this in a version control system because it's just a it's just an exercise. But in the real world, I would be using my version control system to give me the ability and confidence to make changes and always to be able to step back to a stable position as I make progress. Um, so here's this has children thing again. So we've collected up here. If has children, I'm going to leave that for later, but, I, but I'm spotting something here. In that I, I think there's no reason for us to do separate these two things out. We might as well move this evaluation down to here and just carry it out in line. And then all of this code would be a lot simpler. Uh, so this, all of this is dead code. It's doing nothing. Um, let's carry on. More... If document elements it has history and it says there it has history else if type content is question mark don't do anything at all so that's dead code uh, return a list yeah that's dead code oh, that's a redundant comment read xpath string from post request and generate the real xpath for talk so that's actually doing nothing at all uh, I can't delete this because this is a public method and I don't know what's calling it. But according to this, nothing in the code that I have is calling it. I can certainly delete that because that's doing nothing. So this is waste as well. This is another one of those things that's... This is actually where I got the information in order to build my test input data. I'm not going to delete that right now. Uh, yeah, this is just... Looks like a program and just using to themselves. Um, let's get rid of that, that, that. Yeah. Right, so here's, here's the main method and actually this main method is only a test and we have a test that's a test, so we can get, delete that main method. That's We've replaced that with a test. So let's run our test again and make sure that we haven't broken anything. Everything's good. As I said before, at this point I would commit. Let me just run the coverage again because we've just made some changes and the line coverage has gone up. So now we've gone up from about 86% to, or 85% to 89%. So that's, that's, that's a step in the right direction. Right, so let's go back to our code. We're in a stable position. We, we, know, what's, uh, we know that we're, our code is doing exactly what it was doing before because we've just run the, the approval test. Remember, uh, the approval testing is powerful. 
It gives us, it's simple to add to almost any code base. It gives us a strong defense against inadvertent changes to that code base and so is the perfect backboard against which we can work to, to carry out really the refactoring steps that we need to to get the, sh the code into a more workable shape. Removing clutter is also important. It makes the structure of the code that we're working in much more obvious and therefore it makes it easier for us to spot those changes that we can make to improve the, improve the code. Remove the dead code. Keep, have a version control as a backup, but remove the dead code and then you will get much better visibility into the structure of the code. And the last and most important of these pieces of advice for refactoring is work in small, tiny steps. Always give yourself the opportunity to step forwards, and if you make a mistake, step back very easily and safely. In summary, uh, this video has really been about the prep work. This is getting the code into a stage where we can start really digging in and doing some really useful reorganization. It's going to make us easier for us to make real progress in improving the code. In the next instalment, we'll start looking at that progress that we can make using the, some of these other techniques and, and that progress will be a little faster. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.